Shalom. This week we are reading Parashat Vayeshev, meaning, and he dwelled, the ninth Torah portion in the book of Bereshit, Genesis, starting at the beginning of chapter 37. The portion of Vayeshev is usually read on the Shabbat before Hanukkah, and when two Sabbaths occur during Hanukkah, as happened some years, then Vayeshev is read on the first Shabbat. You know, the word angst can be a good description of our feelings as we study this Parsha. Angst is a noun defined as a feeling of deep anxiety or dread, and among its synonyms are fear, apprehension, foreboding, disquiet, uneasiness. The deepest angst seems to fuel this portion, because this week's Parsha of Ayeshev introduces the gripping, painful saga of Yosef and his brothers. They are the last part of the formation of Yaakov's family line that all of the book of Bereshit has been leading up to, and which will close the book of Bereshit. This Torah portion also will see the beginning of the sequence of events that will be the cause of the descent of Yaakov and his sons into Egypt, and ultimately the servitude of the nation of Israel. The first verse of Vayeshev begins with the words, and Jacob dwelled in the land of his father's sojourning, in the land of Canaan. Commenting on the idea of Jacob now settling down after all his previous travails, the sages of the Midrash state, Yaakov wanted to dwell in peace, as if it's not enough for the tzaddikim, the righteous, the reward that is waiting for them in the coming world, they also want to be at peace in this world. And so the trouble of Yosef sprang upon him. That's what the Midrash says. Yaakov's reward for wanting some peace was the trouble of Yosef? What's the idea here? In fact, the verse in Job, chapter 3 and verse 25 states, I was not secure, I was not quiet, I was not at rest, and torment has come. Tradition ascribes this verse to have been said by Yaakov. I was not secure because of the trouble with Esav. I was not quiet because of the trouble with Lavan. I was not at rest because of the trouble with Dina. And now? Now the torment of Yosef is upon me. In fact, Yaakov's life indeed seems to be one trouble after another. But you have to understand, Yaakov is not looking for the life of Riley or even for a day off. The idea of and Yaakov wanting to dwell in peace expressed here, after everything that he'd been through, refers to the idea that really all the righteous want is to bring holiness into this world. This was Yaakov's life's work and all he ever wanted, for the world to be at peace with Hashem's presence. He wanted to be that bridge that connects between heaven and earth, the ladder that he himself saw in his dream, set firmly on the ground with Hashem at the top. This, he knew, was the responsibility of the birthright and the obligation of the blessings he received. But still Yaakov was not really of this world. He was not so connected to this world. He was so above it. And in order for the goal to really be accomplished, the goal of bringing the light of holiness into this world, he knew it would have to be Yosef. Of all his children, he knew that Yosef was best equipped to be firmly part of the physical world, yet strong enough to not allow it to conquer him, as evidenced by Yosef's victory over himself later in the parsha, passing the test of the temptation of his master's wife. Yaakov knew that Yosef could be the conduit of this divine blessing and that he alone could channel it to the rest of the tribes of Israel. That's the key verse of the whole parsha to aid in our understanding of the dynamic between father and son and the unique aspect of Yaakov and Yosef's relationship is the next verse, verse 2. In English, in order for it to make sense, we need to punctuate it with a colon and read, these are the generations of Yaakov, colon. Yosef, at age 17, was a shepherd with his brothers, etc. But in Hebrew it reads, Ele toldot Yaakov Yosef, which is more correctly rendered, these are the generations of Yaakov, colon, Yosef, meaning, Yaakov saw Yosef as the continuation of the legacy of the forefathers, itself the legacy of Adam, to bring the knowledge of Hashem into this world and ultimately to bring the redemption. This is the meaning of the words we read. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons since he was a child of his old age, and he made him a fine woolen tunic. True, Joseph was a son born of old age, very special to a father. And true, Joseph was the son of his most beloved Rachel. But do not make the mistake, the mistake of thinking that Yaakov was guilty of simple favoritism. According to a very special tradition, the coat that Jacob made 
was none other than the garment of Adam himself, which had been passed down through the generations through a most circuitous route, and which Yaakov passed over to Yosef in passing on to him the responsibility of continuing the tikkun of Adam HaRishon, the first man. But that quote is another story. A hint the Torah provides is the use of the name Israel in that verse. It was Israel who loved Joseph the most and made him the fine woolen tunic, not Jacob. Our sages teach that the word Israel over use of the word Jacob in the Torah from the time the name was given always refers to a higher level of prophetic consciousness and to the collective of Israel. You know, this Parsha could really be called Fathers and Sons. And there are so many twists and turns. Let me briefly review the main events of this Parsha. Brotherly enmity is a major theme here. I'd hate to say hate, but the verse does state his brothers saw that it was he whom their father loved most of all his brothers, so they hated him. They could not speak to him peaceably. Ouch. There are so many deep levels of meaning here as to what the issues were between brothers and Joseph. They disagreed over the proper way to serve God. But according to the simple meaning, hatred develops between the brothers and Yosef. Firstly, because they saw their father give Yosef a coat. And then their hatred was intensified when Yosef told over to them his elitist dreams that foretold his dominance over his brothers. This sound animosity ultimately leads to the brothers, seeing Yosef approaching towards them on his father's mission, to advance a plan to kill him. Reuven prevents this, and planning later to return and retrieve Yosef and return him to his father, Reuven insists that they throw him into a pit instead. Then the brothers sit down to eat bread. <laughs> what does that even mean? On Yehuda's advice, they decide to sell him to a passing caravan of Ishmaelites. He was actually sold several times. The brothers stain Yosef's coat with the blood of a goat and bring the coat to Yaakov, who identifies it and thinks that Yosef had been killed by a wild beast. Yosef is sold to Potiphar, a servant of Pharaoh, the chief butcher of the king's kitchen. In the meantime, the Torah's narrative suddenly switches to the puzzling story of Yehuda and Tamar. Yehuda's eldest son, Er, was married to Tamar, but as the verse states, he was evil in the eyes of Hashem, and Hashem caused him to die. According to the sages, Er did not want Tamar to become pregnant so as not to mar her beauty, and thus he wasted his seed. Yehuda's second son, Onan, marries Tamar, but he too wastes his seed, rather than fulfill the commandment known in Hebrew as Yibum, a mitzvah based on Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6, requiring the brother of a man who dies without leaving children to marry his brother's widow so that his brother's line will continue. God kills Onan as a punishment for this. After the death of two of his sons, Yehuda is hesitant to let his last son, Shelah, marry Tamar, thinking that everyone who marries this woman seems to die, but excusing his refusal on the boy's young age. Tamar is forced to return to her father's house and remain unmarried to wait until Shelah marries her. But she knew prophetically that she was meant to bring Yehuda's descendant, King David, and thus Mashiach himself, into this world. She knew Yehuda was wrong. Thus, when she finds out that Yehuda is in Timna, she disguises herself and waits for him on the main road. Not recognizing her, and according to the teachings of our sages, having first established that she is neither an idolater, nor a married woman, nor betrothed, nor impure, Yehuda lies with her and leaves her his personal effects as a deposit, his seal, his cord, and his staff. When afterwards he seeks to pay the woman, she is nowhere to be found, and he gives up on his items. After three months pass, Yehuda is informed that his daughter-in-law is pregnant, and presiding over a court of law, he pronounces a verdict over her to be put to death. As Rashi points out, she is a daughter of Shem, himself considered a Kohen, a priest, and thus, as the daughter of a priest, such behavior is unacceptable. As she is being taken out for the sentence to be carried out, she sends word to him, privately so as not to embarrass him, confronting him with his things and asking if he recognizes them, saying, to the owner of these things I am with child. As the Midrash relates, what goes around comes around, said the Holy One, blessed be he to Yehuda, as it were. You fooled your father with a goat, now Tamar will fool you with a goat. You said to your father, do you recognize this? Genesis 37, 32, referring to the ruse of Yosef's coat. So Tamar will say to you, do you recognize this? But continues the Midrash, she will mean, please recognize Hashem in all of this. What people call karma, or at the very least, poetic justice. Yehuda admits that she's right, cancels the death sentence. Twins were born, Peretz and Zerach. Peretz is the ancestor of King David. 
So a theme is already at work here, the two messianic forces, the Messiah, the son of David, whose light, as the sages put it, was being prepared by God at this time, and the Messiah of Joseph, the forerunner of the Davidic Redeemer, who preceded Israel's descent into the spiritual darkness of Egypt to prepare the way for their ultimate redemption. Meanwhile, back in Egypt, Yosef is already there. He's been sold to a prominent servant of Pharaoh, Potiphar, chief butcher. Because everything about Yosef reflects godliness, Yosef finds favor in his master's eyes and is put in charge of the entire household. Hashem blesses the house on account of Yosef's presence. There's only one problem. Potiphar's wife is a sexual predator, obsessed with Yosef, and tries relentlessly every day to seduce him and convince him to lie with her. He adamantly refuses, time after time. But one day, when they were alone, she was exceedingly aggressive in her advances and she took hold of his garment. Yosef escaped, having no choice but to flee, leaving the garment behind in her hands. She framed him, claiming he tried to rape her. The angry master Potiphar has Yosef thrown in the dungeon. But there too, Yosef continues to radiate blessing. He shines with this indescribable charisma, and he finds favor in the eyes of the prison warden. The warden places all of the prisoners in Yosef's custody. So while in jail, Yosef meets two of Pharaoh's servants, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. One day he sees they're disturbed, and they relate to him that they both dreamed a dream, and they don't know what it means. They tell Yosef their dreams, and he offers an interpretation, according to which the chief cupbearer will be released in another three days and will be returned to his job, while the chief baker will be hung in another three days. Yosef implores the chief cupbearer to remember him to Pharaoh when he's free. The two interpretations come true, but the chief cupbearer doesn't remember Yosef. He forgets all about him. All of this, everything that we're learning about in this week's portion, is the backdrop, it comprises the circumstances leading up to what became Israel's exile in the land of Egypt. For reasons that were determined by Hashem's wisdom alone, the nation of Israel's exile in Egypt had been decreed yet at the event known as the covenant between the portions, when it was foretold to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 15, know of a certainty that your offspring shall be strangers in a land not their own, and they will serve them and they will oppress them 400 years. That had to happen no matter what, because it was God's decree. Why, you want to know? The sages put forward various ideas. The simple understanding is that this exile served not as a punishment, but as a preparation for the giving of the Torah. It prepared the hearts of the children of Israel for accepting the Torah and for the responsibilities of nationhood and for their duties in this world. The events of our Torah portion of Vayeshev begin the actualization of this decree and it informs us of the events that were to lead up to the nation's descent into Egypt. For indeed, Yaakov and his children were the founders of the nation and the Egyptian exile began with them. Everyone involved in this story is playing a role and they may think whatever they may think, but actually all is arranged by divine providence as Yosef will eventually tell his brothers when he's reunited with them later in Parshat Vayigash, that it was all part of God's plan and all for the good. Although the unfolding of events that led to the exile were part of this divine decree, still the Torah is imparting an important life lesson to us. For although the exile was decreed at the covenant between the portions, it came about through Sinat Chinam, through the baseless hatred between the brothers and Yosef. This hatred was not the primary reason for the exile, that had already been decreed, but yet it was the vehicle, the device, through which it came about. Thus the sages teach in Tractate Shabbat, said Rav Chama Bar Giora in the name of Rav, a person should never show any favoritism between his children, for on account of a garment that weighed two slaim, which Yaakov gave to Yosef, his brothers were jealous and events transpired which caused our forefathers to descend into Egypt. The sages were well aware that the exile had been foretold to Avraham. They're not saying that this enmity caused it, but that it facilitated it. A Torah lesson to consider very carefully in our relationships. I mentioned that Yosef is connected to Hanukkah. There are many allusions in our parsha as well as in Parshat Miketz, which recall Hanukkah. And there is the major concept of Yosef as the, prototo the prototype of the Yosefian Redeemer, Mashiach ben Yosef, who paves the way for the ultimate redemption accomplished by Mashiach ben David. 
and of Yosef who survived and thrived and flourished as an uncompromising Jew in the depths of the heathen culture of Egypt. Theme of Hanukkah. But I would like to offer a simple thought. One of Yaakov's outstanding characteristics is that he wants to fix the world. He's an activist, he's an initiator, he's even an agitator. Back in Parshat Vayetze, when Yaakov arrived in Haran, a simple anecdote is told. He sees the shepherds gathering early in the middle of the day on work time, and he gets involved. Still early in the day, he tells them, not time to gather the flocks, go herd them. Why is he getting so worked up? Why is he getting involved? Such a simple story. Why did the Torah relate it? Because it teaches us that Yaakov cannot remain passive or silent when he is confronted with a situation that he feels is not right. He's motivated to try and fix. Yaakov's son Yosef follows in his father's footsteps. The righteous Yosef, when he sees that Leah's children are not behaving properly towards the sons of Bilha and Zilpah, they ostracize the handmaidens' children, they called them slaves, he does not hesitate to take action, firstly by warming to them, by associating with them and trying to lift their spirits, and also by bringing the matter of their negative speech to Yaakov's attention. And Yosef knows himself and his mind. He thinks it's important for his brothers to know his dreams because they have merit. So he tells them. Yosef knows very well that this might lead to envy and hatred, just as Yaakov knew back in Haran that the shepherds might not take kindly to his unsolicited advice. But they both follow a path of truth, their own rule, without fear or hesitation. Yosef demonstrates this quality of steadfastness consistently. He goes at his father's bidding to inquire of his brothers in the flock's welfare, though he realizes the danger in, in his dealings in both the house of Potiphar and in prison, he works to improve and fix the, the respective situations as best he can. This is the spirit of Hanukkah. Matit Yahu and his sons decided not to hide but to act with strength and determination to rise up against the oppressor, to address the problem, and to try and fix it. Surely there were many others, many, many others who were despairing over the decrees of the wicked Antiochus, but they weren't willing to take a stand and to try to do something about it. Only Matityahu and his sons. Hanukkah is the holiday of Jewish strength and freedom, but the light of Hanukkah bursts forth from willingness and initiative and action, the desire to fix the world. These are the attributes of Yaakov and Yosef. These are the generations of Yaakov, Yosef.